Hey everyone. Today I want to talk about 3D printing and 3D scanning. This is something that I've been involved with since the, we'll say, early to mid 90s when I worked at General Motors. They had the technology and the money to print out some small parts for testing purposes, fitting purposes. We were doing stuff inside of the engine compartment. These were going to be clips and troughs for routing spark plug wires. And I remember that first part they brought out, a little SLA, it was so fragile, you had to be very careful, you just hold it in the palm of your hand very delicately and you know, make sure you don't do anything stupid with it because it would break. They had several of those printed out. It was an SLA if I recall. Decent surface finish, the works. And basically since that point forward, the only thing that's really improved, I hate to say it, is the type of materials, you know, the printers have gotten better, but overall, what gets sent to print hasn't changed much until recently and thank goodness that it is starting to change now before i get into it if you would please do me a favor the most helpful thing you can do if you're not subscribed to the channel is to subscribe to the channel please and if you are like the video and share it with some friends and of course leave a comment tell me you like my new haircut anyway 3d printing as I said, I was introduced to it in the early to mid 90s and it was a miraculous thing. And I remember looking at the part and feeling the surface finish and thinking it's kind of rough and I wanted to get an understanding of it. So I had a chat with the people that were in charge of the tool, that division, and what went in and what came out. I learned early on that everything is based on an STL, what's called a stereolithography file or standards triangle a library file or whatever some people want to call it. So you take an STL, put it in the printer, they slice it, and out comes the part once it is made. Really good stuff. And basically that's how things still work. And what an STL basically is, we'll take a look at the screen, I have Katia V5 up. I've designed a cylinder. And on that cylinder what I did is I tessellated it. Now this is a tessellation with a one millimeter tolerance to the cylinder so that's why it looks very choppy. I also have a tessellation that's to a micron of the cylinder 0 0.001 and as you note it looks a little better but it's still choppy. The reason why this is important is because what happens to this data when I bring it into my slicer. So I'll bring up my slicer. I'm going to open and I'll start out with the one with the gigantic tolerance, the one millimeter tolerance. It's going to bring it in and the moment you see it, right, you look at it, it doesn't look all that great, right, because it is very faceted because of the very loose tolerance, but that's what an STL does. It makes a bunch of triangles. So I'm going to slice it. Now notice the slicing happens pretty quickly, very fast. The amount of time it takes, the amount of material, 10 hours, 9 minutes, and 136 grams of material. So it does a good job. What I want to do is I'm going to preview this. And then I'm going to take this down somewhere in the middle and I'm going to zoom up on it. What's happening is the path basically comes to this point, next point, next point, next point. The head is basically traveling in a straight line from point to point. And that's why our surface finishes on STLs, when they're printed, are not that great. They are always traveling linearly. Now, mind you, this is not a true XY direction. This is not a true XY direction. This is a little bit more complex than a box. So to get from this point to this point, the vector is defined as basically it's kind of going in the X and it's kind of going in the Y and it's just traveling in a straight line. So we end up with facets. And this is the most extreme case. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Now I'm going to go and open 
this fella and I'm going to slice it. Now, if you remember, it was pretty quick to slice the first one. This slicing takes a little bit longer, maybe two, three times as long. A little bit more material is being used and the amount of time it takes to print goes up a little bit. Okay, it's not a drastic amount between these two, but there is a delta. You can see it. This is roughly, I don't know, 25 minutes longer. And this is roughly nine grams heavier because there is a lot more detail on that cylinder. But in order to really show it, which it's going to be difficult, it's, I don't know if the display will allow it because the triangles are so small. But it's still basically doing the same thing. It's cutting and then connecting the dots that it sliced with a straight line. But these straight line segments are very, very small. So it looks more cylindrical. This is great. It gives us a much nicer part, but it's still a rough surface. Okay, it's not like the head is traveling in a true circle. It's not truly going around the part. It's just a sequence of very, very short lines going around the part. So the surface is still faceted. You'd still have to do a bit of finishing to it to make it look smooth or make it look nice. It's a lot less work than the prior one, but it's still a certain amount of work. And that isn't anything that anybody in the industry is doing wrong necessarily. It's just, this is the old technology. Stereo lithography files, STLs, were introduced sometime in the 80s. And they haven't changed. Okay, maybe the format of the STL has changed. Different scanners produce a different thing, whatever that may be. But STLs are the same. It's basically a tessellation. It's almost like draping something over the top of the shape and tucking it in, almost like a foil or a clinger app, and then taking that and then printing that, making something based on that. That's what the tessellation is. It doesn't have the true geometrical elements of that shape. Now, what I've seen recently, I've only been around for a little while, is some slicers are able to work with a step translation. STP or STEP. Step files are the true geometric elements. Okay, so I'm going to hide this. It comes back to this. If I were to step this out, for people that are heavy into 3D printing that may not be familiar with steps, it's kind of like a tessellation, but it's not changing the shape at all. It's taking the true geometry and using that to go from one file to the next whatever that may be, maybe from CATI to NX, or NX to CREA, or CREA to CATI, or SOLIDWORKS, or Solid Edge, any of these. So it's the true shape. It's defining the shape, topology, the works. So cylinders are cylinders. Axes are still there. The planar faces are still there. The works, all of it is still there. So when you print off of something like this, which some slicers now have the capability of slicing, I do believe the people over at Kira that make Ultimaker are looking into this, maybe a subscription service, I don't know. But it's a fair bit of work to change that algorithm significantly enough to make step files importable to slice from. So rather than the printer, you show this fella, having to jump, like when I slice in this spot right through here, or maybe I slice closer to the top. This is a big, long, straight line. This is a big, long, straight line. This is a big, long, straight line. If I slice through here, now mind you, these are planar, like, but we can't have four-sided triangles, can we? I still end up with a big, long, straight line, but somewhere in the middle, there's a break. And then another line. Okay, that's what the printer is looking at. That's how it calculates. So... The more complex the STL, the more little straight lines. And 
when you introduce a step into this, it's the true circle. The printer can print a true circle, right? It's just basically an infinite changing of the x, y as it goes around the circle, or depending on your printer, whatever your axes are on the table. That's all it is. That's all it is. So our printers are capable of doing it. Our designs, obviously, we can make these things. Not a big deal. It is the technology, the interoperability between the shape that we have and the steps that we need to go through to get it from this shape to the printer. It's that big chunk of technology that is now finally being improved after all of this time. Another big point of contention I have because of 3D printing is it's changed the way people design. You still have to design the part. It still has to fit. It still has to look right. It still has to meet all the criteria for performance, durability. All of these things are critical. And what I see are a lot of people, when they get into the maker space, they're designing their parts, great parts. They go to make it, but they never designed it properly to print it properly. So they may have to adjust the part on the table in order to not have a, a, a part or an area of that print that's going to fail and break. Okay, that's a very important thing. And I see lots of videos addressing that. Good job for those people that are addressing that. It's nice to see that kind of camaraderie. Now I have this lovely little print. This is a little aircraft that I designed on and did quite a bit of work, especially the lofts and the nacelles and all the other stuff. Anyway, you know, you look at this guy. It's cool. It's a great little thing. It was printed in this direction. But if you look at this, you know, it's, there's a little little cracks right in here. And that's because this is a thin area. And the printer was going around in this direction. It's just the nature of the prints. So, you know, would it have been better to print it like this? You know, sitting on a table like this? You know, like this? Probably not like this because these would break off pretty easily. You know, maybe printing it at a slight bias so there is no, you know, weak spot. So there's a lot of things that are considered when you're going through to do the print but also the design people are designing things like they're going to machine them or they're going to injection mold them or they're going to do some sort of forming to them no you have to design it like it's going to be printed if you know you have a weak, weak spot if at all design it to minimize what's going on in that weak spot the stress riser or whatever that may be you may have to get creative with what goes on with that design and that very, and I hate to say it like this, but that very banal, oh, we can just 3D print the part. No, you can't just 3D print the part, right? It, if you want something that's got high levels of quality and reliability, you have to do more than just print the part. You have to think about how it's going to be designed. Now, some of the quality questions are being answered because of new technology and being able to take step data across into printers. I wouldn't doubt it if you see things in the near future where you have attributes on the step file because faces can have different colors. You can label things, give them names, and those attributes, when they get imported into the slicer, you have macros that are running behind the scenes that say, oh, wait a minute, you know what I need to do? This face has this attribute. I need to run the tip over the top of this twice because I, I want something to be smooth. And maybe it runs in one direction, crisscrosses in the opposite direction, right? Or maybe the wall thickness in an area needs to be twice as thick as it is in another area and you can program that into the step file and as well as again deep considerations for how the part is designed so you don't end up with stuff like that not just print it okay so those are my concerns and i think my concern about the design is extremely valid because what I'm seeing from a lot of people that are now entering the industry is that they think that 3D printing is this panacea, this fix-all, and they've never had to experience the agony of defeat of their parts failing, profoundly failing, when the part wasn't designed properly to be printed, or the printer wasn't capable of doing the print correctly, 
or one of a various reasons wasn't oriented correctly in the printer, whatever it may be, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So as a designer, it is up to you to make sure you design that part so it will stand the test of time. Fatigue won't be a thing, that type of thing. Or, you know, there's no, uh, unfortunately, there's always going to be some weak spot on the part, but minimizing the failure modes of those weak spots because you do have a little bit of freedom to do stuff differently because of the printing. It's just don't forget how to design stuff.